Hello and welcome to another segment of Interviews That Matter. I'm your host Raj Mehta. Friends, in this segment we bring those guests who influence our lives. This includes elected officials, heads of major organizations, policy makers and other dignitaries. It is my sincere hope that the knowledge brought in by these people will help our community. November 6 is an important day this year and it's an election day. We are going to meet today Judge William Gellor who is running as a district court judge from the District 2 from Nassau County. Let's meet Judge Gaylor. Judge, welcome to the show, sir. Thank right. you so much for taking time. My Appreciate pleasure. it. Really, my pleasure and my honor to be here. Thank you, sir. First of all, you know, I would like you to describe yourself and give us your background. I, I've read about you on the internet and everything, but, you know, uh, for the viewer's benefit. Sure, absolutely. My name is Bill Gaylor. I'm a uh, Long Islander. Born and raised here on Long Island in the South Shore. I grew up in Freeport, uh, about the fifth grade or so. That would put me at about uh, 12 years old. I guess we moved over to Baldwin. Uh, I graduated from Baldwin High School. I attended Nassau Community College uh, for one year. After the completion of the first year, I enlisted in the United States Army uh, on what I thought was going to be a three-year enlistment turned out to be almost 24 years, 23 plus years uh, that I wow. remain on active duty in the service. Um, thank, thank goodness uh, and thank God to uh, a bunch of great non-commissioned officers who were uh, leading me, pushing me along, uh, and recommending me for officer candidate school. Um, uh, and ironically, the first time I applied to officer candidate school, uh, all excited uh, because I thought I was going to become an officer. I received my little 3 by 5 card from the Department of the Army, Washington, D.C., um, looked at it and it said, thank you for your application to Officer Candidate School, but others have been found more favorably qualified. Uh -oh. <laughs> so then the Army, in its infinite wisdom, shipped me off to Korea, uh, where I got to spend another year uh, in Korea. This is back in 1983. Right. And um, upon my return from Korea, I applied again for Officer Candidate School. This time was accepted. Attended Officer Candidate School uh, over the winter of 1984, early 85, and was commissioned as an officer. And, uh, I became a lieutenant in the Quartermaster Corps of the United States Army and served uh, until 2004. Wow. Yep. Great, great. So you don't give up, I guess. I don't give up. We keep trying. You keep trying, right, until you get it. We try harder. <laughs> and uh, all along the way, I continued to work on my education. Um, so when I went in the Army, I had one year of college under me. I ended up getting a, a bachelor's degree from the State University of New York, uh, Excelsior College, which runs a Regents program. Um, and allowed me, while I was in the military, to transfer my credits back uh, to the State University of uh, New York system and, and get a degree. I then went on to obtain my master's degree uh, from a university called East Texas State University in Texarkana, uh, Texas. It's now was, was absorbed into the Texas A&M uh, school system, so it's now a Texas A&M school. Texarkana. Um, and then uh, from there, I uh, obviously got my law degree from Hofstra University wow. when I came back to Long Island and um, graduated uh, with the Juris Doctrine from Hofstra. So we keep, uh, we keep pushing along on all fronts, really. Uh, education is so important nowadays. Um, and uh, my daughter just graduated from NYU. She's living in the city. Uh, she's thinking about uh, working for a year or so to gain some experience and then possibly going back to school. Uh, but uh, the life is her, the, the world is hers for the taking. So we encourage her to keep pushing and uh, striving to be better each day. And uh, we're blessed, really. Yeah. So that's my life story too. I don't give up. Yeah, we can. And I guess, you know, that's the way to go, really. No, uh, you can never come be, come right. complacent with right. uh, your, your station in life. There's always something more or uh, challenging or different or a way that we can make a contribution back to our communities right. and society or to our nation. So we keep we keep giving back. Right. And you had a successful career in Army. Like you raised all you know, raised all the way to Colonel. Yeah, I, uh, I enlisted as a private E1. We can't get any lower than that with no no rank on your shoulder and. Uh, 
by the time I came out, I was a lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant colonel, okay. Lieutenant colonel, which is uh, an 05. Uh, uh, the, the next promotion would have been full colonel, and then you have, obviously, brigadier general after that. Okay. Uh, but uh, no, we chose to get out of the service, in, uh, and I say we, because it was a family decision mm -hmm. back in 2004, because my daughter was in high school, um, I had returned from uh, being posted in Europe for three years, in 2001, and um, I would have redeployed back overseas for another three years, but my daughter being in high school, um, the family you know, made a decision that we didn't want to pull her out of uh, 10th or 11th grade, right. uh, at a time when that's so important you know, right. for, for young people to, right. to, to do well. So, I decided to retire from the service and let her finish out, uh, you know, her high school years in Limburg and uh, begin her college career, basically. Uh, so you have one daughter? We have, uh, I have one stepdaughter. I have two children uh, from a prior marriage. They live in Georgia. Uh, okay. My daughter, Christine, is 28, mm -hmm. and my son, uh, Bill, is uh, 26. Were you involved in any combat situation? Yeah, any I time? was. Absolutely. absolutely uh, it's hard to escape uh, combat tours, especially in today's Army. Uh, not much different uh, during my time in the, in the Army. I uh, served in the Panama invasion. I was in Panama, um, that was back in 1989 to 1990, uh, where the government uh, ousted Manuel Noriega from Panama. Uh, right. Uh, due to the atrocities that were going on there. Um, so I was in Panama for 13 months prior to the invasion and then uh, through the year and uh, returned back to the States in May of 1990. And then um, I was later deployed to, uh, when I was stationed in Europe, we deployed to Albania and then Kosovo for the okay. Kosovo right. invasion. Conflict, right. and, uh, <clears throat> uh, thankfully that was a relatively a, uh, short mm -hmm. you know, excursion. I was down in uh, Albania and Kosovo for uh, almost five months and then redeployed back to Heidelberg, Germany, where I was posted. I was stationed with a NATO unit, so we spent most of our time uh, in the Ace Mobile Force, uh, deployed somewhere within the NATO uh, countries. What was your role when you are in combat situation? Like, well, I was are you a, on the administrative side? Or? Yeah, I was a, a NATO logistics officer, so okay. responsible for sustaining the force while we were in uh, Albania and Kosovo. Basically, we would. Uh, my job was to bring in the logistics, either, uh, and, and logistics is accomplished in, in, in a couple of ways. All, all working hand in hand. Host nation support. What uh, things can we get from the local communities? Uh, food, fuel, uh, spare parts. Being that it was Albania and it was not a well-developed country at that time, uh, most of our support uh, was ordered from Italy and Europe flown in from the United States. Uh, we're responsible for establishing contracts with government contractors. Uh, some of the big ones, uh, you know, Cisco uh, provided a tremendous amount of food and whatnot. Uh, but uh, government contracts to sustain the force basically while we were there. So, so basically infrastructure, you know, in, well, in logistic and infrastructure. Exactly, logistics and infrastructure. Like yeah. yeah. Uh, when we say infrastructure, we're talking about basically um, building up the local community or country, Albania, which was part of NATO's mission was to develop a road network from the coast to uh, Kosovo, basically, so, right. so vehicles can be offloaded uh, by ship uh, in, the port, in uh, the port of Duras in Albania and then uh, road transport through the country of Albania to the Kosovo border where they would stay or pre-position until it was a conflict uh, began. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the NATO forces, and predominantly the U.S. Navy CVs, uh, laid a road network uh, of hundreds of miles from the port in Albania through, uh, through the country to a city called Kukis on the border of uh, Albania and Kosovo. So we watched that, but that, that's, when you say infrastructure, that's what you're really talking about, building up a country so to sustain the force. Oh, okay. And while we were doing that, my primary mission was to sustain the NATO and American forces mm -hmm. um, with, with supplies, to resupply them basically, and coordinate and arrange for the resupply of the different commodities of fuel for the uh, NATO. And from Borstuga, 
Exactly. What are, what's the bullets? You got it. Right? Boots yeah. Bullets. Well, we, we were involved in supply chain for defense logistic agency for creating a system for them. So yeah. it was like from all the way, you know, tracking all those from from the order point to you know until it arrives. Yeah, absolutely. We're tracking all these. And I would imagine that uh, with your company, you were probably involved in tracking order ship times. Absolutely. From when yeah. the soldier made the demand on the battlefield until the, the part, and that was transmitted electronically through the system from a warehouseman yep. in Texas or wherever it was that one of the depots pulled apart yep. and it was uh, shipped back down to. So any time, given time, our system will tell the uh, commodity or whatever is ordered by the soldier where it is. Yeah, and that's very important yeah. to yeah. guys like me who are on the, you know, in country right. waiting for that part, that critical part to, to make a vehicle or a helicopter um, uh, flyable or drivable, drivable again, so very, See. very critical. So you are there until the mission is over. Like you have to be there, right? Yep. Stay on there stay until the mission is over. That's correct. So we fly down, and mm -hmm. we, uh, or if you're in the 82nd Airborne Division, you jump in, um, you do your mission, mm -hmm. and then you're, uh, you're you, you get out. You can fly back out, or take a ship, a boat, or something that uh, vehicles and you come way out. So thank you, Judge. We'll take a short break, and we'll be right back. conversation with Judge Gaylord. Uh, judge, now you were a colonel, now you're a village judge. That's correct. Uh, how was the transition? I mean, I know you went through Hofstra and got a law degree. Have you ever practiced law before you became a judge? Oh, absolutely. I worked for quite a few firms. Okay. Uh, while I was in law school, I was also an intern uh, each year uh, in the district attorney's office in Nassau County. I did an internship for uh, various firms. Uh, gracious enough to give me an opportunity to, to be an intern. Um, once I received my uh, law degree, I took the bar exam and uh, passed on the first try, which is something that uh, is, uh, nowadays is very hard to do because the pass rates are on the high 60s or 70 percent, but uh, I was fortunate enough to pass the bar exam and uh, began working for other firms. Uh, when I came to the revelation or the epiphany that uh, I can probably do this on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, very hard uh, to take that transition or make that step to, to when you're working for somebody, you have a guaranteed paycheck coming in every week right, and you right. know, things are okay. Eat and, that up. And to give that up and, and, and uh, take a chance on yourself. Right. Uh, and I did. And I opened my own practice and I have my own practice now in uh, Nassau County. It's in Lindbergh, okay. Atlantic Avenue. And, uh, okay. We're a full, full service firm, uh, civil litigation. Uh, criminal matters, uh, whatever may come in the door. If I can't personally handle it, I'll find the right lawyer for it. Mm -hmm. to handle it. So uh, when, you know, you, when you are in a village court, right, mm -hmm. I mean, what are the normal cases that you get to hear? Well, for the last three years, I've been the village uh, associate justice for the village of Limerick, so it's, right. it's quite a great opportunity uh, for me. Uh, the village court system is basically the, what I call the court cloak closest to the people. Okay. All right. Ninety-nine percent of the population, mm -hmm. if they're going to have a um, interaction with the criminal justice system uh, or the justice system, it's going to be at your village, your local village court. Mm -hmm. All right. So the village court system is set up pre predominantly here in Nassau County to handle uh, all of your local traffic violations, all of your violations of your village ordinances and rules, uh, housing violations, illegal occupancies, code violations, fire safety violations, uh, especially in the commercial uh, businesses, uh, you know, regarding to the sprinklers, exhaust, whatever. Uh, they all come before the village uh, justice court. Our village justice court uh, in Limburg has two two judges, one elected, one appointed. Okay. Uh, we we hold court in Limburg two nights a week. We're a very active court. Uh, we have our own police department. So, um, and, and geographically, where Limbrook is situated in the southwestern part of Nassau County, uh, many crossroads come through <coughs> come through Limbrook. 
You have Sunrise Highway, a major uh, east-west road, you have Merrick Road, east-west, you have Peninsula Boulevard coming up from uh, inward in the five towns, from the Rockaways, passes through Greenbrook, uh, Peninsula Boulevard. Uh, so these major roads all converge uh, through Limbrook. And uh, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, I guess it depends on how you look at it, <laughs> it keeps us very active in the village court. So uh, two nights a week we're busy. We have a docket usually of about 120 defendants, 120 people coming in. Wow. Okay. Uh, the court is conducted at night, so the people can come after right. work. Right. Right. We normally start at 7, and we run until we're done. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if I get a traffic ticket, how, how can I get out of it? What is the secret? <laughs> How do you decide that? <laughs> that will be interesting to the viewers. I don't know about uh, getting out of it, per se, or if there's or, a magical way to Well, what is the rights of it? Yeah, we'll talk about the process a little bit, maybe. Uh, basically, if you receive a ticket, right. or as I sometimes refer, an invitation to appear in court, right. um, you've got to uh, enter a plea. Okay. So the first time you come to court, it would be for an arraignment. Right. On your arraignment, you basically uh, be informed of the charge and you make a, a plea of guilty or not guilty. Right. If, you, if, a, if a person were to plead uh, guilty, um, the matter would be disposed of right there. Mm -hmm. If a person pleads not guilty, they'd be given a conference date to come back, talk to a village prosecutor, mm -hmm. and then if a resolution can be had between you and the village prosecutor, um, the two of you would approach the judge and uh, we'd have a discussion and we, we try to resolve the matter. Right. If though the prosecutor and uh, you could not come to a resolution or an agreement or a meeting of the minds, uh, you would have a trial. You would demand a trial and say, I'm not guilty. I don't want to take an offer uh, that the prosecutor is offering me. Uh, I want to have my day in court. Mm -hmm. So let's back up for a second. As part of the arraignment process, everybody's informed of their rights. These are the rights that are bestowed upon us by our, uh, our great country, and they're, ne they're never taken away from you. You have the right to uh, be represented by counsel, okay. to, to go and hire a lawyer to represent you, or at least to seek the advice of a lawyer before you enter into a, a final disposition of your case. Whether that be on the first time you come to court, or as I'll remind you along the process, you always have that right, uh, and you can ask for a lawyer at any time. And I'll give you that right uh, if you're appearing before me. You have the right to confront your accuser. So you do have the right to demand a trial and, and be shown or uh, be shown the evidence that the prosecutor has that he plans to, to that he'll use against you or to confront, confront the person that wrote the ticket, the police officer or code enforcement officer or uh, fire safety officer, building you know inspector, whomever or whatever the prosecutor is going to use. You have that right to uh, examine that, that evidence. That's part of the trial process. Uh, you also have the right to present your own case, uh, witnesses and evidence, photos, uh, to prove uh, your side of the story, for lack of a better way of saying it. And only after a judge, or after I'm uh, convinced that the prosecutor has met his burden, would you be found guilty. So, my advice would be um, to talk to the prosecutor, determine whether you need the uh, assistance of counsel, seek the advice of counsel, and at least talk to a lawyer before entering into a disposition, or have that lawyer come back and represent your interests. Um, and uh, if you're not satisfied, demand a trial. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, now, you know, you're running for a district court judge. Yes, I am. And that is on, election is on November 6th, and you're running from District 2. That's correct. Um, so what will be the difference now? Until now, whatever cases you tried in this district court will be a totally different ballgame, I guess. A little bit different. Okay. Um, some similarities. Mm -hmm. the, the village court where I've been, here's those cases that arise within the jurisdictional uh, territory of the village of Limerick. Right. Either the village of Limerick Police Department mm -hmm. uh, or Nassau County policeman passing through, issues a ticket or summons, you end up in the village court. The village building department writes a citation. For whatever reason, you end up in the village court. For many of those uh, residents who of Nassau County who don't live within the incorporated village, right. one of the incorporated villages, and there are many of them, and each village right. has its own village court system, so it's very similar. But for those that live in uh, the 
unincorporated parts of Nassau County, those traffic uh, tickets are either going to be heard at the Nassau County Traffic Agency or depending on the severity of those traffic violations, are going to be up in district court. The district court also um, is the first place that every, every person who is arrested on a criminal matter, a serious uh, criminal matter, meaning a misdemeanor violation or uh, a felony charge uh, of the penal laws of the state of New York, ends up. So whether it be a driving while intoxicated charge, a murder charge, a murder allegation, or um, anything in between, shoplifting, uh, those folks are ending up at the district court for initially an arraignment where the charges were read publicly and a plea is entered, very similar to the district court, same process. And then the, the matter is either moved to the county courts for felonies or it may stay within the district court itself for the misdemeanor charges and be transferred to a resolution court. So for some people, the district court will be the first court uh, that they would come in contact with. So it might be their people's court for those in the unincorporated villages. Uh, the district court also handles the landlord-tenant matters that arise within the county. It handles the small claims matters uh, and civil matters up to uh, involving uh, matters in controversy up to $15,000. Uh, contract disputes, or disputes with uh, your home improvement company right. uh, might end up in, right. in the civil court. So the, the civil court of the district, civil part of the district court is rather, rather a better way of saying it. So the district court handles not only the criminal matters, but right. also civil Same matters, right. landlord tenant, small claims. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for those citizens uh, of, the, of the county, uh, Nassau County. So November 6th uh, is the election day, and uh, your your name will be there as a district court judge. How many how many judges will be elected on that day well, on the district court? Uh, because I live and reside in Nassau County, uh, right. in the in the town of Hempstead portion right. of the county, right. okay. uh, I'm running for the second district, okay. which covers the geo geographical area of the town of Hempstead and the city of Long Beach. Right. So there are three district court positions that are coming open. Okay meaning that the terms of those three judges that are sitting in those positions now uh, so expires. Expired, right. And uh, I'm running along with two other folks uh, to replace those three. Okay. Okay, so three versus three. That's how it works. Three versus three. So, so then, you know, pretty good chance of getting elected. Uh, we would think. Right, because, you know, I mean, <laughs> listen. You know. I hope I have a better than 50-50 <laughs> shot at it, but yeah. Well, we want to wish you good luck anyway, but, absolutely. you know, I, I, I now I know that it, there is really, you know, I mean, three versus three. It's three versus so, three. And, and, I, and you are also a good friend of our very good friend, Judge Pasala. Yeah, he's a, he's a dear friend of right. mine as well as I, I, I know he's a dear friend of yours. Right. And I've known yeah. Judge uh, John Pasala for many, many years. He's been a supporter while I was in the military uh, of mine. Uh, he continues to be a supporter. He's an absolutely uh, uh, wonderful, intelligent jurist, a uh, great man and a great American uh, who loves his community and his country. Um, and, uh, and he's a great friend of Indian community. Yeah, absolutely. 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 So, I mean, you know, once you get elected for district court, how long is the term? District court uh, judge is elected for six years. Six years, okay. So after six years, you may have to think about something else. So right now, I cannot even ask you for future plans. Uh, my future plans are to meet the great citizens of our county, and especially in the town of Hempstead over the next few weeks, and uh, just uh, encourage everyone to get out and vote. It, it is a presidential election year. Yes, sir. Uh, very yeah. important that we, uh, yep. we get out and we exercise our right as American citizens and vote. Well, we want to wish you lots of luck. Well, I you appreciate that. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Well, appreciate well. it. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. If you have any question, comment, and concern, you can email me at rajmitv at gmail.com. Again, that's rajmitv at gmail.com. Until next time, see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.